Okay, so what I'm going to try to cover is an overview of how quickly how genetic data is generated, a little bit of how it's structured, and then what are some examples of two ways to analyze it. So I'll talk about genome-wide association studies, which is profiling a large population to try to figure out how does some difference in the genetic code relate to a change in what we call a phenotype, so some kind of observable characteristic. Um, and then I'll talk about a few places where you can find publicly available genetic data. And then I'll also share an example of two competing, we'll call them phenomenons in the field right now, where there's a lot of interest for good reason in data sharing, because especially for people with rare diseases, where you might only find a couple hundred people in the whole world, it's really important for centers across the world to communicate and share their data. Um, but there's also big issues of de-identification. A lot of that is due to the fact that our DNA is inherited. So I'll cover one interesting case. So I'll just do a quick overview of how next generation sequencing works, the, the sort of data that's generated, and also where biases might find their way for those of you who are interested in analyzing it. So basically we have these short couple hundred base pair length fragments that they stick to this flow cell. And then they amplify it a few times. So you end up with these clusters where all the clusters are a single sequence. So they chop the DNA up into millions of like couple hundred base pair pieces and then they attach it to this thing and they make clusters and then they add base by base fluorescently labeled A's, T's, G's, and C's. And the real innovation here is in the, is in the high resolution camera. The chemistry and the camera are the two things that make this uh, so important. So as they add these fluorescently labeled A's, T's, G's, and C's, you have this big flow cell that's full of millions of these little clusters and they light up different colors at different times. So the camera keeps track of yellow, yellow, green, yellow, green, blue, and then it comes up with a sequence from there. So then you end up with what we call reads. So you end up with a, a list of a couple hundred base pair fragments that all came from the original genome that you chopped up. And so then the next step is you have to actually assemble those small fragments. And that's a non-trivial step because there's a lot of weird repeated regions and things like that. But for the most part, that, that problem is more or less solved. But that's basically how it works. So there were a lot of companies at the time when this was invented that were doing things similar to this. Um, but Illumina happened to do it best and probably more than 70% of the total sequencing traffic. But this is a picture from Beijing Genomics Institute, which has the largest set that I know of, of Illumina genome sequencers. So this is about probably more than 20 of these. Stepping back a little bit, that was the whole genome sequencing. The, the first thing that was really feasible to do en masse and at cost was the genotypes. So this is where you take a few million, these are called SNPs, it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. So you basically profile a, a bunch of individual sites in the genome and focus on the ones that we know are varying within human populations because these are more likely to lead you to some interesting hypothesis. And the basic idea from the get-go for a genome-wide association study is comparing cases, which are people that have whatever thing it is that you're interested in. It could be a disease, it could be a characteristic uh, to controls, people who don't have that thing you have. And you can do it on a quantitative scale as well. It doesn't have to be categorical. And I want to just explain this idea of linkage disequilibrium, which is really important, and it's actually what makes the genotype so powerful. The idea here is that you're, you inherit your DNA from your mother and father, and you inherit it in big chunks. Um, so you're not getting like a single site from mom, a single site from dad, single site from mom, single site from dad. So uh, over relatively short periods of time, you have big blocks of your genome that are identical to other people in the population. You can use these to trace back lineages. Over a long time, these blocks get degraded, and there's something that we call crossing over, which is where they switch. And so if the crossing over breaks some of these blocks, but why this is useful in genome-wide association studies is because if you've tagged this site here, the one they've marked as M, then if you know the block that it's in, you can guess everything in between. So you don't have to sequence this entire block because you can, we call it the, the word they use is impute, but you can basically use the population data. If you have data from a big population, that you've whole genome sequence, you can use it to fill in all the blank space. And you make a few errors on the fringes, but for the most part, uh, it allows you to get a lot of pretty good data for free. 
with genome-wide association studies, there have been a number of different things that are studied. So from common diseases like Alzheimer's, morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes. I wanted to put those two on there because I was at a conference and 23andMe was presenting some of the data analysis that they did on nail biting. And they found a few different associations in the genome, some of which have to do with like neuroticism, like you might expect, or, or people who are obsessed with cleanliness, and other ones had to do with the sort of proteins that go into your nails, and also it's the same one for people with curly hair, that they were hypothesizing actually made your nails a little softer and maybe more chewable. The interesting thing about these studies is they allow people to generate a lot of hypotheses, but it's not always, uh, I don't know, sometimes researchers let their imaginations get the best of them, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't always lead to the right answer. And also whether you're a morning person or a night person, they also had people fill out surveys, so you're morning person, night person, simple, and they saw some pretty strong genetic associations. I can't show you that data because I haven't published it yet, but they were just talking about it. When you do a genome-wide association study, you end up with something called a Manhattan plot because it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. So across the x-axis here is the whole genome. So the genome separated into chromosomes. You have 23 of them, two copies of each. So they've only got one through 22 here because the last one is a little funky. It's the X and the Y chromosome. So women have two X's and men have an X and a Y. So it's a lot harder to analyze those because there are some complicated population dynamic issues that go into analyzing those. But basically what they've done here, so the Y axis is the negative log of the P value. Basically the higher this is, the stronger their statistical signal that this site is associated with whatever it is you're studying. So. If you look at this really strong one over here, that's the APOE gene, and this is the first one that was ever discovered as being associated with Alzheimer's, and since it's been followed up to try to get into what is it about this gene that's underlying the biology, you can also see this streak of dots below it. That's because of the linkage disequilibrium that I was talking about before. So you have this single site that is presumably causing or related to your phenotype of interest, and all the things around it are also statistically significant just because they happen to be attached to the important one. They're in that chunk of DNA that's shared. So you see this all the time. Whenever you see a statistically significant signal, there's other ones around it that sort of form this sharp peak. Um, so, but once you've identified this, the, the job's not done because even though that they've labeled that top peak as the APOE gene, but it really could be anything within that block of DNA, right? So they, so the next step is what we call fine mapping, where you go in and you whole genome sequence people and you test specific hypotheses. You look at some of the genes that are in that block of area that's implicated and try to follow up on which ones um, the most likely to be doing what's going on. And this is really useful because you can follow this up with specific hypotheses for testing drugs or interventions or, or figure out the mechanism of what's going on. Here's another example from 2012 where they looked at obesity and then once again they've come up with eight or nine different locations that all show a really strong association with presence or absence of obesity so to get something this strong you have to gather quite a few people so I think this study probably had 20 or 30,000 people um, and this one was done recently it was just published on 300,000 people from the UK Biobank so the UK Biobank has about half a million people and they've all been genotyped and they have all this information on them, height, weight, information about their parents. Another thing they have is how much education have they had. So they looked at any of these sites that could explain relative differences in their educational attainment. They found everything above the black line is considered statistically significant, and they found the strongest one up here, presence, was associated with an extra nine weeks of schooling over your whole life and absence was, was zero. So you could imagine if you, the lowest one was two weeks. That was where their cutoff was. You could imagine if you hit the genetic lottery and got all of these, then statistically you're, you're somehow predisposed to become more educated, whether that's because your memory is better or you're more creative or whatever it is. So they've now got a task at hand to dig into these sites and figure out exactly why it is that uh, there are specific parts in their genome that are associated with greater educational attainment. This is a cool plot of all the genome-wide association studies that 
have been done. I think this is a couple of years old now. They're colored by the type of disorder they are. So some are metabolic, some are anthropometric traits like height and weight. Some of them are uh, cardiovascular things. So this is across all the 23 chromosomes. We've got just a ton of things that we've discovered associated with phenotypes. So the, I think the most important thing about this is it allows us to generate really specific hypotheses about something we observe or a disease that then allows you to go deeper into the biology and figure out, is there a way to design a therapy based around this gene we've implicated or can we understand the mechanism better? Um, here's one final example of a sort of genome-wide association study. Google uh, decided that they wanted to get into the genome sequencing game, so their first major project was looking for people that were over 110 years old and they genome sequenced them, but they didn't find anything very significant in this paper. So there's some sources of publicly available genotype data, although if you're looking to do one of these on your own, um, there's really not a lot out there that people have submitted themselves. So there's a website called opensnp.org where you can find about 3,000 genotypes, and then another one called the Personal Genome Project where you can find about 1,000 genotypes and 500 whole genome sequences. And like I said, to put that in perspective, 23andMe has a million to two million people um, but theoretically, everyone can download their own genome sequence and put it online if they want to. But actually, very few people have done that. Uh, but there's other good sources of genotype data that I'll show you. One of the important things to consider, depending on the sort of data analysis you've done, in biology, you have to really think about some of the underlying biological principles, particularly that idea of linkage disequilibrium. So, you might approach one of those genome-wide association problems, like a, a sort of pure machine learning problem. You've got a positive set and some negative set, and you've got a bunch of genetic features that you're trying to use as a predictor. But you're going to get really nailed by the fact that the primary source of variability amongst your samples is where they come from. So this is separated by, that's Chinese and Japanese samples. That one is from Yoruba population, which I think is in Nigeria and Africa, and then that one is uh, Europeans living in Utah. This comes from the Thousand Genomes Project, which he mentioned earlier. So it's a thousand people from all across the world. It was sort of a first attempt at coming up with a picture of genetic diversity worldwide. But if you took a set of unlabeled genetic data and tried to do a genome-wide association study without taking this into account, and you happen to have more Europeans in one set and more Chinese or Japanese people in the other set, you would get a bunch of false statistical associations that were not driven by the effect you were looking for, but were in fact just driven by ancestry. So this is one example of you can't just charge in blindly with data analysis in genetics. You have to kind of think about how is this data generated in the first place. So the simple way to do that is, and what most people do, is they separate their data out using this principal component analysis and you just do your analysis in the European set or you just do it in the Chinese-Japanese set. The, one of the issues here is that the vast majority of all samples that have been collected to date are in that European set. And so when people recruit new patients, they tend to focus on European subsets because they know that they can interpret them better because the reference populations are European to begin with. So this is a bit of an issue um, that I, I think is hopefully getting better, um, but it means that a lot of the Genome-wide association studies are biased towards European populations, and a lot of the effects of these changes in the genome are, are dependent on the rest of the genome. So even in this Thousand Genomes Project, the vast majority of the people who were sequenced were Europeans, although they did a pretty good job. This was in my tutorial, actually, so I showed you the, that little star was a person that we just downloaded online, and we used the Thousand Genomes to make a reference of these three sets. And, uh, and the little star, which is this guy who's a geneticist at uh, Harvard, was the little star that was squarely sitting in the European thing. So he's put his genome data on his website and said, feel free to <laughs> use it and put it in all your slides. Okay, so the second case study that is what my PhD is focused on is the idea of genetic diagnostics. So this is a project that's based here in the UK at the Sanger Institute called the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project. So this is different than a genome-wide association study because you don't go for a huge number of people that you've genotyped. We go for uh, families. So these, we've collected about 10,000 trios. So these are two parents and a child with a developmental disorder that 
the way they're recruited is if they visit their clinical geneticists here in the UK and they can't figure out what's going on, then they get enrolled in this genetic study. So it's very different in the sense that you don't have a very specific phenotype going in. So you don't say recruit tall people, recruit short people, or recruit people with type 2 diabetes, people without. They all have developmental disorders, but they'll all be individual sets of very rare disorders. And the idea here is to figure out, given some child and a genome that the child and the parent has, can we determine which variant in his genome or her genome is causing what's going on, or it may be multiple. Um, so there are some parts of this project that for the bioinformatician you don't really see, uh, and that's enrollment in the study. So they've got to be referred by their clinical geneticists, and then they draw blood, and then they mail it to the institute. Uh, and one thing that's also really helpful is the uh, doctors do detailed clinical phenotyping. So they describe do they have a facial abnormality, cranial abnormality. Sometimes they do an MRI and tell you if they have any brain issues. Um, a lot of these kids also have issues with their heart or issues with their immune system. And all those things kind of form a profile of the child that is really important later. Uh, and then also there's all that laboratory work I was talking about at the beginning that goes in. Um, and the data that comes out of sequencing can still be pretty messy. It's not like a Netflix recommender thing where you got five stars, four stars, three stars. Maybe sometimes they clicked it wrong and made a mistake, but generally it's very clean data. In this case, the machine makes mistakes. You get sample swaps, you get contamination. So there's a lot of work that goes in before you can actually do the analysis that makes it a little tricky. Um, so as I said before, you usually start with raw data of about 30 to 100 gigabytes. This is the read. So if you sequence to, in our project, we sequence to what's called 50x depth. So that means you, you try to get about 50 reads per site. So that tells you if they have two different letters at the site, you should get about 25 of each. Um, if you have the same one, then you'll get 50 of each. Um, and so that means we get a pretty big raw file, um, but you can quickly process that down into what's called a VCF, which is just the differences. It's compared to some what we call reference genome or like a normal genome. What does this person have that's different at any particular site? So you're only going to be different at one in about every thousand sites to the reference genome. So that's why you can get about a thousand fold reduction in the size of this file. So the VCF file is just a list of all the positions in the genome where you're different than what we expect. And the expectation is just agreed upon by the whole community. So there's a published reference genome and every once in a while they update it because they find a new gene or they make some changes. And so that's what everybody uses as the common standard. Um, and of course, as you might imagine, it's also European. And so you end up with more polymorphic sites and people that aren't from European origin. So the goal here is to identify any sites in the patient that are different from this reference, then we can use those to try to figure out if one of them is involved in the disease. Okay, so option number one, once you analyze this set of variants, is that you get lucky and you find one of the variants in the child that has already been described somewhere else um, as being involved with a disease that's plausible for what the clinician has described as your child having. And that happens to us in about 25% of the cases. So there are two main databases that people use. This one's, one's called ClinVar, the other's called the Human Genome Mutation Database. And the way this works is if you're running a study like ours and you discover a patient, let's say we discover 10 patients that all have the same mutation, same gene, and same phenotype, you deposit it into this database and describe it. So then if somebody else finds a single patient with that later on, they can just match it up in the database. Um, so these are really useful ways of determining if something that you've seen has actually already been seen somewhere else. But there's also, as you can imagine, a little bit of noise in this data as well. Sometimes clinicians submit things that they think that they're sure is causing what they have, but in fact somebody proves later on that it doesn't actually cause the issue they have. So you have to kind of interpret these databases with care. Okay, so option number two is if you can't find anything that anybody's already described, then you try to look through the list of these variants that you have. So I said it's about one in every thousand sites. So you've probably got three million variants to look through and you want to predict what they're going to do. Are they going to result in some functional change or are they going to be neutral? So this is basically the way DNA works. You go from DNA to RNA 
which is an intermediate, single-stranded, more or less version of the DNA. And then the RNA turns into proteins. So ideally what you'd like to know is does some change in the DNA sequence result in a downstream change in the protein? The way this works is it's a triplet code. So every three bases within a gene turns into a protein. And these are redundant. So you have 20 amino acids. So proteins are just like a line of amino acids together. But you have 4 times 4 times 4, 64 different possibilities of a three-letter sequence for DNA. So there's some redundancy. So in this case, they're showing the sequence TTC and TTT both turn into the same amino acid, which is lysine. But if this T here gets mutated to be an A, then it results in the protein being truncated at that spot. So whatever was going to come after that lysine, you now no longer get. Uh, and then these are two cases of, actually, if you change it from TTC to TCC, you, get, you still get a protein, but you get a slightly different amino acid. And it turns out that these amino acids, some are more similar to one another, and so some of these changes are more easily tolerated. So they called this conservative and non-conservative. So there, I don't know if you can see like all the little methyl groups on the outside of these things that... Uh, Usually what it is is whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So for the chemistry people in the room, it's do they like being on the outside of a membrane or the inside of a membrane, that sort of thing. So the whole point here is to now look at all the 3 million sites in our person and figure out what are they going to do to the protein that they're eventually coding for. Um, and is it going, and is that a, such a super important protein that it's going to cause this widespread phenotype? So luckily there are tools for this. Uh, this one is called the Variant Effect Predictor. It's been around for a long time, and it basically does this for every site in the genome. So you just feed it a change, and it says it's either silent or synonymous, we call it, or it's missense, which means the protein changes, or it's a truncating, or so we call it stop gain, or protein truncating. Generally, it's the worst because some big chunk of the protein gets chopped off, and it usually means that it's not going to do the job that it does. This gets you pretty far, so about a third of all the possible changes that you'll make end up being synonymous. So generally those won't have any effect on the child, and you could throw those out. Um, and actually most of the missense changes also don't have much effect. So the primary thing that you're looking for is some loss of function or truncating mutation in a gene that we already know is really important. But those cases, so in our cohort, we're looking at, the reason we have parents and a child is because you can pick up mutations in the child. So generally the parents are unaffected, but the child has some severe illness. And so if you look for things that are present only in the child and neither parent, then it's usually a much stronger indicator that it's doing what's wrong in the child. So in about 10% of the cases, we find a mutation that results in a loss or a truncation of a gene that's known to be involved in development. And so then that's a pretty strong indicator of what's going on, but that still leaves more than half the cases that are unsolved. So there's another tool. The computer science machine learning people in the room are probably thinking that this is a good idea. It's called CAD. It stands for Combined Annotation Dependent Depletion. Um, so basically, it takes the variant effect predictor. Is it silent? Is it missense? Or is it protein truncating? There are also other uh, things that it can do, and it uses other information on top of that. So it, uses information about what the gene that it's in does. It uses information about how, we call it conserved, a site is across evolution. So if, this, if the segment of DNA is unchanged between humans and mice and fish, usually you go all the way back to frogs. If it's unchanged that whole time, then it's a really strong indicator that it's maybe an important site. Um, so it uses that information and it also uses population frequency data. So another thing is, and if you look at a healthy population, like the Thousand Genomes Project, anything that's really damaging, you shouldn't see in those healthy populations. So it uses that as sort of a, a negative indicator. So what they've done here is the score goes from zero to 60, and they just showed that if you look at all of the variants that were reported in one of those databases, ClinVar or HGMD, that they get the highest score. Any variants in genes that are known to be essential also get high scores. And then I think this one's really cool. If you look at olfactory receptors, so these are genes that involve scent. None of the mutations, even the stop gains, the protein truncating ones in those genes are highly tolerated because we don't really need them. They don't affect, in genetics it's all about whether it affects your reproductive fitness or not. So if you 
lose the ability to smell cucumbers or something, it generally doesn't affect because it might have affected us when we were back in our like primate smelling days, but these days the olfactory receptor genes just get bombarded with mutations and nothing happens. And these are, the LOFs just stands for loss of function genes. So you can use this score to take your list of variants and rank them, prioritize them by how damaging they're predicted to be. And then you end up with schemes like this. This is a, from one of my colleagues that they published this last year. So you end up with this kind of filtering strategy. They did this in 4,000 families. So you can see, so that's mom, dad, they're white because they don't have the illness. And then the child is dark uh, because they have a disorder. And sometimes you have an unaffected, or sometimes you have a sibling that's unaffected and that's useful information. Um, because it usually means that it's a mutation in the child. If you have two affected siblings, it's probably something inherited because mutations are pretty rare. And so they take all this information and they say, okay, family two and family four both have a mutation in gene A. And then they look at what's the probability of observing two of those mutations in gene A. So you have some model for how frequently do mutations happen. And you say, what's the probability of observing this data under our null model? And then you also say, Remember, the clinicians gave us all this data about the child. Did they have heart problems, immune problems, MRIs, whatever? Then you have a model to compare how similar are these two children's clinical symptoms to a set of random children that are drawn from the population. So then you get two independent statistical measures of how likely is it to see these two mutations and then how likely is it to actually see this overlap of phenotype. Uh, and then if both of those are statistically unlikely, meaning this is probably a diagnostic variant in the two of them, then you can put it in a mouse and see if it causes issues in the mouse. And if, if this information is strong enough, so if you have four or five families that all have the same mutation, the children all have similar clinical symptoms, then it gets pushed to the top of this list of new compelling genes. So they discovered four new disorders, each of which had 10 or 12 kids in it from this cohort. So it's a kind of small, it's, a, it's about 50 people out of 4,000. That's like 1% or something, right? What we think is happening is these are the cases that are really simple. These are mutations, and those are the first ones that you find. But a lot of this is actually going to be caused by multiple sites in the genome. You can imagine that it's not always a single hit. Sometimes you have one hit, maybe a missense mutation that makes the gene weaker at doing its job. And this gene's interacting with a bunch of other proteins and some network, right? And then you get another mutation that critically weakens some other gene, and then they interact, and something bad happens. So this is going to require actually a lot more data to tease out these two mutation, three mutation sort of effects. Studies like these put all their data in this database called the Database of Genotypes and Phenotypes. So if you want to, you could download 12,000 exome sequences, which is where they just sequence the genes from this schizophrenia cohort. That's about half people with schizophrenia, half that are healthy. And then this one here, Vanderbilt Electronic Systems collected metabolite data when people were taking pharmaceuticals. So they wanted to learn how does their genetic background interact with the drugs they're taking. So the hypothesis is that your genetic background will make the dosage that you need for a drug different. It'll make your side effects different. There is tons of data on this website if you want to mess around with it. They have a whole section that's dedicated to what they call autism omics studies. So this is like genetic data. It's also phenotype data and other metabolomics and those sorts of things on children with autism. So you could probably find upwards of 30,000 people there. And then they also have the same, for instance, for schizophrenia. So they have a bunch of different sets that are organized by phenotype. So if you have a hypothesis that you want to look into, then you can download this data and check it out. And while we're on the topic of data sharing, I just wanted to quickly go into this, what I think is a sort of interesting narrative and battle between data sharing and privacy. So there was this paper, which I think was published two years ago, that really caused a stir. So it's, as you can see, it says identifying personal genomes by surname inference. And what they did here was take genomes from public databases like uh, they used the 100,000 Genomes Project, 
uh, and they used publicly available data on the internet to try to determine if they could find the person that actually submitted their data to this project. So they used things like zip code, last name, and they also used any publicly available ancestry data. Like they showed an example here. This guy is actually within the genetics community is very famous. His name's Craig Venter, but he put his genome in the 100,000 Genomes Project. And they managed to, based on publicly available information, uh, find that it was pretty likely that this genome belonged to somebody with the last name of Venter. And then when they dug further, they could actually figure out that he was likely in California. So they did this with 10 people from the Thousand Genomes Project that all had high quality data, and they managed to recover surnames and locations in five of those cases. So the thought process here is if you've put yourself in a study for something that you maybe don't want everybody to know that you have, or you maybe don't want your insurance company to have. If you live in the United States, then life insurance companies can still discriminate technically on genetic information. Then using this publicly available data, somebody could look you up without your knowledge. So one thing that was proposed to combat this issue, so the, the thought process is we want to encourage people to make their data publicly available because the genome-wide association studies with hundreds of thousands of people are much more effective than with a couple thousand people. And also the case with the rare diseases. So this consortium came up with this idea of a beacon. Um, and this basically allows you to create a network of people who are involved in the consortium and you can ask a question you can say, do you have this one? Do you have any genomes with an A at position, blah, 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 blah. And you send it out to the whole network and everybody else sends back no. Or maybe one person says yes. So this is useful in our case. Let's say we have three patients that have similar clinical symptoms and a similar mutation, but three is not enough for us to really say it's not just a statistical fluke. So we can send this beacon out and say, does anybody else in the network, has anybody ever observed a patient that has this genotype? And if somebody sends back yes, then you open contact with them and say, this is what our patient looks like. Does yours look anything like that? And so that's the idea. So you have this kind of hub and spoke network where everybody has a common API that allows you to ask questions uh, and receive answers back. So that's Decipher is, the, is what this project that I'm on is a part of. So it's a big database of genetic variants. So this is just from when they started. But they use this, they call it a matchmaker exchange to kind of ask each other for data. But this is also an issue. So somebody posted a paper in 2015 where they showed that this beacon approach, as you might imagine, is also still vulnerable to attack. So if you ask only a very small number of questions, you can actually uniquely identify somebody that's in the system, especially if you focus on really rare sites. So the thought process here is if I already have Alexander's genome sequence, or a relative of Alexander's genome sequence. This is like, so this black line here is your cousin. If I have Alexander's cousin's genome sequence, about 25% of the time with 40,000 questions, I could identify whether or not he was in that study. So if Alexander's cousin posts his data online, then it actually leaves Alexander vulnerable to attack. This is again because of the idea of linkage disequilibrium. So this 0.125 is how related you are on average to your cousin. So identical twins have 50% relatedness, right? Because they get a random half from each parent and it decays outwards like that. So you have one quarter of your grandmother's DNA, right? So if somebody could backtrack you out of one of these uh, studies that you've been enrolled in. So I think it's really interesting. There's a lot of ways to combat this. So you could have some sort of rate limiter or ratchet up the cost. Maybe you make it cost a tiny amount to make an API call, right? But as soon as you get past 2,000, you start to make it cost a lot more or you require credentials beyond some certain point. But the point is there's, there's always somebody thinking about how to exploit this data. One of the other things that I think is really interesting in this context, there's a, a lot of support being gathered for this project called HGP, right? So there's a human genome project where we're trying to read it and now they'd like to launch a project where they learn how to write it, the whole thing, right? So you can imagine how interesting and useful, but also really dangerous something like that could be, right? Uh, if I swipe Alexander's glass after we have dinner together or something, I can sequence him. And then if you can write arbitrary genomes, I can what? I could leave his DNA at a crime scene or that sort of thing. I think a lot of people don't like this sort of analysis because it prevents 
people from sharing their data. But I read a really interesting thing once that Bill Gates, when cyber crime was starting to really ramp up, he said, like, I guarantee cyber crime is not going to be an issue. Like, this is a passing fad. Maybe somebody can confirm or deny that that happened. But I'm interested to see how this comes out. A lot of people in the field say, like, bio cyber crime is not going to be a thing. But I think you could, if you use your imagination, you could think of reasons why somebody might want to exploit something like this. Okay, so I'll wrap up here. I just think I didn't cover any of these, but there's other interesting things you can do with genetic data. So you can reconstruct human migration. Um, again, this is because of this idea of linkage disequilibrium, that by sequencing modern day humans, you could figure out the migratory patterns out of Africa, crossing of the land bridge into America and figure out when they did it. And also, if you're European, you're probably you're between one and 3% Neanderthal DNA, which I think is pretty cool. Then there's genome editing, which you've probably all ever heard of. Does anybody know what they did to this cat? This is actually pre-CRISPR. So they took a gene from the jellyfish and they spliced it into the cat's genome so they get it to fluoresce green, right? And this was, so CRISPR was, I think it was 2012 that it really started to take off. This is a new genome editing technology. This was well before CRISPR and CRISPR makes stuff like this a lot easier to do. So it's really cool. You can think of the amazing applications. And you can actually set up biological switches so when they, like if you feed them a certain food, it turns on or off. <laughs> or change, changes colors, yeah. Your imagination is the only thing holding you back. Um, and this is an example. So this guy, Craig Venter, uh, published what they called a synthetic essential genome. So they made a bacteria that had what they thought was the minimum possible number of genes. So this is an example of they call it like building life from the bottom up. They figured out what is this core set of genes that's essential for life. And this idea of writing the human genome is also sort of synthetic biology. Okay, so if you're interested and you want to do more, these courses are really good, especially if you don't have much of a programming background and you want to get into it. It's a really good crash course. So there's one coming up, Intro to Data Science. They also have machine learning and natural language processing. Thanks. <laughs>